beautiful. Okay, my name is Abigail Bass. I'm Kalia Bass. Xander Blunt. Julie Covins. Harris Copeland. And Victoria Estrada. Riley Hackworth. Andre Mortensen. Logan Pekis. And David Reyes. And welcome to our final presentation. All right, so our mission requirements this semester, we were given project goals to fit within certain size and weight constraints. Our entire design has to fit within an eight foot cube and weigh under 55 pounds. It also has to uh, complete three laps in five minutes of this course over here, which equates to about 8,900 feet, which is about 30 feet per second or 20 miles per hour. Our design goals as a group were to create a vehicle that was good for search and surveillance capabilities, meaning we wanted something that kind of focused on stability over speed, and we wanted something that would be good at low speed and low altitudes. And we wanted to make sure from the beginning that we were designing for 3D printing manufacturability with PLA. So taking all that into consideration, we moved on to our initial estimations. For our initial estimations, we looked at aircraft that were around our, like, got our, our anticipated wingspan of about four feet and made out of PLA entirely. So our gross takeoff weight was estimated to be about five to six pounds. From that, we found our wing loading of about 2.4 to 2.88 um, pounds per square foot. Our thrust to weight was estimated to be about 0.6, which is typical of vehicles around our size and weight and our capabilities. We wanted something to be around a trainer for typical RC aircraft. Our lift to drag was estimated to be 11, and our cruise velocity was estimated to be 40 miles per hour, given the 20 miles per hour. Our overall CAD model, as you can see, we chose a high wing design to focus on stability, as far as well as a few other elements here. Like take a look at that. Okay. And this is the top view of our design. So you can see the wingspan of 48.8 inches. Our cord length at the root is seven inches and our cord length at the tip is five inches. And then this is the side view and the length of the fuselage is 33 inches and the max height is 5.4 inches, which varies along the length of it. And then this is the front view. Um, where the width, the maximum width is 3.7 inches, which also varies along the length of the fuselage. All right, moving on to wing design, uh, several key factors playing into the uh, overall design of our wing. First, we selected a NACA 2412 uh, airfoil, uh, optimized for low speed performance. Low speed performance is, is vital for our airplane because we want to have like this potential application to surveillance or slash patrol applications. So low speed is definitely common in this area. Uh, additionally, as Abby mentioned, we made use of a high wing configuration, not just for stability, but also to maximize visibility. Um, mm -hmm. And moving on, we use clip wind tips in order to maximize our maneuverability while also maintaining stable flight characteristics. So first off, we uh, we made you we combine the spars, uh, ribs, and stringers into an X uh, structure in order to maximize or in order to make use of three D printed manufacturing options. Uh, we also decided to uh, make holes within these structures in order to minimize our wing weight. Uh, the X structure that we use is mainly to maximize the rigidity throughout the wing and make make sure that the whole structure is, is concise and, and, and strong enough. We made use of a spar uh, hole in order to make use of a carbon fiber rod that spans throughout the whole wing. And in order to increase the rigidity, I mean, the strength of the whole wing during flight. We also strategic, strategically placed servo holes and servo cable holes in order to uh, seamlessly, seamlessly, seamlessly integrate all these uh, components into our wing. Okay, so the structural analysis of the wing, uh, the first step was finding what kind of loads it would be seeing. So we assumed an elliptical load distribution seen over here. And the max lift created by the wing, which would be at the wing root, 
was found using the weight, span, and loading factor. The loading factor was found using the uh, design characteristics of like 40 miles an hour and um, the fact that it was a more maneuverable plane rather than like a showy plane or a fast plane. The elliptical distribution is seen here and that is a complicated equation to integrate. So we assumed a linear distribution while also compensating with the wing tip, the uh, taper ratio, which helped uh, move the, the linear distribution up on the curve to more closely follow the elliptical distribution. And then with that, we were able to calculate a, a moment at the root of 8.961 Newton meters. Moving on. So the next step was finding the stress calculations. Uh, the beam design was uh, had a nominal diameter of 0 0.75 centimeters and an interior diameter of 0 0.6 centimeters. Uh, that made it so that the moment, the area moment of inertia was a little bit smaller than if it was just a regular beam. And then using the bending moment calculations, we were able to find a stress of 366 megapascals. So with that stress, we now had to choose a material. Uh, we ended up going with carbon fiber, which was 860 megapascals. The only other material that would have fit our design needs would have been titanium, and that would have likely been expensive and a lot heavier. So with the aerospace general um, safety factor of 1.5, I was able to calculate a margin of safety of 0 0.56, which is good because we have a little bit of room to play with uh, in case we have some unforeseen stresses on the wing. And uh, yes. Moving on to fuselage design, uh, as part of one of our design goals, we want to seamlessly integrate the, our wing components as well as our tail components. And we want to also alongside be able to securely house our electrical components are for either control of the aircraft or propulsion. And so one of the features of our uh, airflow, I mean, fuselage is to have this internal structure throughout the whole fuselage in order to be have a structure uh, sturdy structure throughout and also have uh, you know uh, a strategically placed uh, access point for access to the electrical components. So here is our only our fuselage right this is our design uh, we make here's the strategic uh, access point for our electrical components and uh, removing this nose cover. We also made use of uh, very well placed uh, servo uh, cable holes as well as servo holes, uh, servo motor, I mean, motor, servo, yeah, servo holes into our fuselage as well as um, having these like um, uh, very well placed uh, uh, like attaching uh, structures. For example, for our vertical tail, we make use of this, uh, these extruded cylinders in order to uh, help us with the alignment of the vertical tail as well as making use of these uh, three spar holes that will uh, that go through our horizontal tail and uh, help us align with the structure here uh, shown here. And so our fuselage is not just a shell, right? It's our it's a meticulous uh, structured uh, body where it's it's it makes use of an X structure in order to reduce buckling throughout the skin, in order to have a strength throughout the, the body, right, of the fuselage, as well as um, increasing our, I mean, decreasing our weight throughout the, the, the fuselage and our complete airway. And so this is uh, just the nose cover that we make use. And so the nose cover is uh, heavily reinforced as we know that it will be taking most of the flight uh, forces caused by the incoming wind. And so we wanted to make sure that this structure doesn't fail to such forces. Right? And so we also make use of a, like a sliding mechanism that will help us um, lock the structure into our fuselage so it doesn't fall off or anything during flight and making sure that it's also clipped uh, by the wing, uh, as you can see here. And we also like integrate the shape of the wing. And so it's you know a seamless, uh, placement on our fuselage. 
All right, so to uh, to attach the wing and the fuselage, we first went with a uh, two bolt uh, fastener that went through the wing, through design holes that went through the wing and the fuselage. Uh, the problem with this was that we found that seeing the picture, it sheared right through and created some holes in our wing. So we moved on to a super glue and Velcro system. Uh, that was for our, for our second flight. We found that that was more than enough, like more, more strong enough to hold what we needed to during flight. So for our third test flight, we're going to be just going on with super glue since there's no need for the extra added Velcro and the super glue will be fine just to fasten itself. Um, and then these holes that you see in the wing are the uh, holes for where the servo wires will go into the fuselage and then attach the receiver. Uh, those have stayed the same for our entire design process. Uh, it just allows the, or as David said, the wires go through the wings and then it has an opening so that the wires can then go into the fuselage. Well, our tail design has remained virtually the same uh, throughout where we have kept with a traditional tail for its simple design and to allow us to attach a steering uh, rear wheel to the rudder so that we can have control on the ground uh, steering. And uh, we also found that uh, through convention uh, that we place the horizontal tail uh, 21 inches from the quarter cord of the wing and that came from the, the root uh, cord is seven inches long and is found to be three times the root cord. It should be where the placement is. Uh, the horizontal tail is a NACA 0012. We picked it because it matches thickness with the wing, but is symmetric because it does not need to produce the uh, lift at a cruise that the wing would need. Um, for sizing, we chose a volume coefficient of 0 0.6 and aspect ratio of five. This is about mid-range for similar aircraft, and that resulted in a uh, reference area of 60 square inches and a cord length of 3.5 inches. For the vertical tail, it is uh, based off of NACA 009 airfoil. Uh, we chose uh, a small, a thinner thickness because it reduces weight, and we found that we could have matched thickness, but we didn't need to for the vertical tail as much. Um, we chose a volume coefficient of 0 0.05 and 1.83, which is once again about mid range for a plant of similar design, which allowed us for a total area of 35 square inches and a cord length of four inches. Um, for our control services, we found that they should take up about a third of the total reference area. And so our elevator reference area is 23 square inches and our rudders. Uh, reference areas 12 square inches. All right, for the landing gear, first off, we chose a tail dragger configuration with two larger wheels in the front and one wheel in the back. This was partially chosen so we could use our specific uh, tail landing gear assembly as seen here. I will further explain that shortly. And we positioned the wheels at specific points uh, before and aft our projected center of gravity with uh, to, to achieve our desired weight distributions with 90% of the weight being on the two front wheels and remaining 10% on the rear wheel. Now for the main components, first off, we had a 3D printed structure for attaching the front wheels to the fuselage, two four inch wheels that will be used in the front, a three millimeter axle connecting the two wheels both to each other and to the 3D printed structure and a tail landing gear assembly with a 1.6 inch wheel. The way this tail landing gear assembly design is so that it connects directly to the rudder so that rudder deflection controls the rotation of the wheel, therefore controlling the direction the plane is moving while taxiing. This limits the need for another motor or servo to control the wheel on the ground. And the way this works is mostly through these two springs right here. They attach both to the uh, assembly itself and the rudder. And in the next slide, get a better look at that. So this is an isometric view. Obviously, this is the wheel. This is the assembly itself. And these are the springs. You can see where they attached. This right here is another structure we printed and glued to the bottom of the uh, rudder. And the next slide, just get a better look at that. Here is one of the holes where the ends of the spring loop through. You can see these are the other two right here. 
And this is a side view just so you can see how everything is put together. Now, our front wheel structure has gone through several design changes. Our original design is in the top right, 3D printed PLA structure with 0% infill. As you can see, it's completely flat on top, so not conform to fuselage at all. And we attached the fuselage just with two nuts and bolts. Now our update design is in the bottom right, still a 3D, 3D printed PLA structure, but now with 10% infill, and it's also wider and shorter than the previous design, now being 11 inches wide and 5.5 inches tall. As you can see from the curve, it is conformed to fuselage shape. And instead of using nuts and bolts to attach it, we just use super glue and duct tape. What all these factors serve to do is reduce the vibrations and wobbliness of the aircraft while taxiing. This, as well as the increase in size from two inch diameter wheels to four inch will be explained in the test flight section. Now the st structural analysis of it, first of all, our margin of safety was found to be 2.08 with a maximum stress of 5.6 MPA at elements four and seven. We This is our model of it right here. We approximated it as a truss element. So the largest stresses were at elements four and seven, which are these two top bars right here. And while these are straight lines here, this is where a fuselage goes. In reality, it's curved, but we chose to make it just two lines just for ease of approximations. And the max, based on our projected weights and projected force upon the aircraft upon landing, we said there would be 50 newtons acting at nodes one and 11, which is where the wheels are. Now this is our overall equation, F equals K times U. F is the force or the vector of forces and moments applied to the aircraft upon landing. U is the nodal displacements and rotations, and K is a 33 by 33 stiffness matrix of the landing gear. Obviously, this is a very large matrix, making it very difficult to do just by hand. So we use a MATLAB script to calculate these values for us. So the propulsion system was picked based on the original assumed weight and our thrust to weight ratio. Uh, we calculated that we needed around three and a half to four pounds of static thrust. So we picked the Tempest brushless motor. Uh, it has a 3.801 pounds of static thrust. And then for the propeller, we chose it based on 20 to 25% of our wingspan. So we chose a 10 by seven propeller. We had a seven inch pitch angle to have the, because it gives us more control during uh, takeoff. And then with uh, our maximum continuous current on our motor is 58 amps. So we needed to choose an ESC that had at least 120% uh of the amps to you know ensure safety during flight and so we went with the 80 amp esc and the ze battery combo uh just obviously based on that safety range and then what we were available during class and in our lab so um our total flight time was estimated on 80 percent of our battery and uh current draw of the motor so we came up with uh 4.16 minutes for our test flight so more than enough uh we have our propulsion system definitely handle our flight and has more than enough juice to take off. Um, the entire propulsion system will be placed in the front to keep our center of gravity forward, and it'll be covered by the design nose cover. Uh, the receiver is separate from our propulsion system, placed underneath the quarter cord, and the battery just attaches to that in order to uh, charge the servos. On the next slide, we have a wiring diagram. Uh, either the propeller is on the outside of our uh, plane connected to the motor and then connected to the battery and ESC down in the front, connect, uh, covered by the nose piece here. And then, as I said, the receiver is under the quarter cord and then the oops, wing servos that connect the ailerons connect in through the designed holes for the wings and the rudder and elevator servos, just the wires go straight through the fuselage and connect to the receiver. So moving on to the static stability of our aircraft. Um, so for each of the three directions, we utilized the approach um, where we took the individual moment derivatives um, of the different components of our aircraft and then summed those together to get the total. So um, starting out with our pitch moment derivative, uh, we took the impact of the wing, the horizontal tail, the propeller, and the fuselage. 
Um, the first three we were able to do without much simplification of their structures um, and do some hand calculations with those. For the fuselage, we did have to um, use a simplified structure where we took an airfoil of similar shape and size and gathered the impact that had. Um, we estimated that it was about, uh, it only um, affected the moment derivative by about 15%, um, not a huge value. Um, so the total we did get for that was negative 0.7 per radian. Um, and this fit within the uh, design criteria we had of uh, zero to negative two. Um, this is just what we saw from similar aircraft. Um, we also were able to get a static margin value of 0 0.489 using our CL alpha and our pitch moment derivative, um, which was greater than zero, which is what we were looking for. Um, moving on to the yaw moment derivative, um, we took the impact of the wing, the vertical tail, and the fuselage, and we got a total value of 0 0.024 per radian. Um, and this, again, fit within our um, design specifications of 0 to 0 0.04 for this value. Um, Showing we had static stability um, here. Uh, and then moving on to the roll moment derivative, uh, we had the impact of the wing, the horizontal tail, and the vertical tail. Um, and this gave us a value of negative 0 0.055. Um, a little bit on the lighter side, um, we were looking for a value of negative 0 0.05 to negative 0 0.3, um, but still within that margin. <laughs> So um, with the dynamic, the dynamic stability, we took the derivatives from the static stability analysis and gathered it in a state model, uh, space state model, uh, which was solved to find the X, Y, and Z uh, position of the aircraft, and then using initial velocities to uh, emulate wind gusts, we were able to find the reaction of the aircraft to those disturbances. Uh, the first wind gust that we used was applied to the line of flight of the aircraft and it showed a displacement on the sea direction, which took about two minutes with small damping to get back to the uh, stable position. Uh, the second wind gust that we, uh, we used was to the side of the aircraft, showing a displacement on the Y direction and uh, with the help of the damping provided by the vertical um, tail, together with the uh, position of the center of gravity, which was closer to the front of the aircraft, we were able to uh, find stability in less than 10 seconds, which was a number that was okay for our requirements. Uh, the last wind gust that we applied was to the bottom of the aircraft, and that one showed a displacement in the C direction, which was expected. Uh, this time, it took about two minutes for the aircraft to stabilize after that wind gust was applied. Uh, what something that we uh, observed in this opportunity was that the aircraft, after it was stabilized, it will change altitude permanently, which meant that the aircraft will need direct input from the pilot to go back to the original altitude. Uh, the second analysis was made using flow five, which allows us to make a uh, read of the idealization of the fuselage and this time take into account a real fuselage that was close to the model that we show in the CAD. Um, we uh, observed two uh, reasonably different uh, results from there. The first one came from the Fugoi mode on the longitudinal um, direction. It showed uh, sinusoidal behavior that uh, let us uh, think that the aircraft will go into a perpetual, uh, it will try perpetually uh, to go back to its uh, stable uh, position without being able to do it going from a maximum and minimum altitude, uh, showing again that the aircraft will need input from the pilot to go back to the stable position. Uh, finally, the graphic is showing the mode three for the lateral um, mode. Uh, showing that uh, similar result with what we got from the handmade calculations, this time with a larger disturbance on the y, uh, y axis, but showing that it will take a lot, about like five seconds for the aircraft to go back to the stable position. All right, so now moving into our manufacturing process. So as we had mentioned before, for ease of manufacturability, we decided to go with 3D printing and we broke our prints into four main parts. We had the wing, the fuselage, the tail components and the landing gear. So in our first iteration of printing, which can be seen in these two images here, we found that our prints were too heavy uh, based off our estimated weights. And so we first attempted to use lightweight PLA to reprint, and we found that the material was difficult to work with based off 
our design, uh, there was not a lot of consistency within the brands. So we decided to reduce weight using other methods. We first uh, reduced the skin thickness and we also increased the sizing between these wing ribs um, just to reduce the weight overall in all of the wings and the tail components. We also slimmed down our fuselage um, and we used a we used special configurations on the printer to make sure that our prints were as smooth as possible. Uh, specifically focusing on the wing, as David had mentioned, there's a spar hole that goes through the wing and a carbon fiber rod that spans throughout. And while this was done for more stability within the wing, it also helped in the assembly process because we were able to align the different pieces of the wings and make sure that they were being glued properly. Uh, to combine or to put all of our components together, we used super glue and we used duct tape to reinforce any of the seams. Um, and for the control surfaces, we have we had two millimeter rods spanning throughout. You can kind of see the rod here in this image and it spans through a hole that's designed into the control surface itself. Uh, so we found that it took about two days worth of printing. Uh, so a two day turnaround to print out all of our components and then an additional day of assembly. This is obviously reliant on the amount of printers that we had access to, but throughout the printing process, we had around three to four printers available to us at all times. And in the next slide, you can see a couple more images of the manufacturing process of kind of assembling it and the different components after they have all been glued together and reinforced. For our first test flight, we found that we were having difficulty keeping the plane down the middle of the runway. We attributed this to our landing gear being too tall and narrow and also slightly wobbly because of how we configured, how we mounted it to the fuselage, which Logan previously talked about how we fixed this. We redesigned the landing gear to be wider and shorter, and we also um, mounted it better so that it wouldn't wobble as much. We also found on this day that our wheels were a little bit too small to um, taxi through the grass. So every time it would hit the grass, it would just kind of go nose first into it, and which would damage our nose and our propeller. So in order to fix this, we used bigger wheels. And we also reinforced the nose section so that it could take more damage, I guess. <laughs> and then on our second, uh, day of test flying, the plane flew two times. The first time it took off the ground and, but because the thrust, the plane had more thrust than initially anticipated by the pilot, um, it stalled pretty quickly because too much pitch was added. It stalled and it crashed, which damaged the wing. It was broken into two pieces or three pieces, I believe. Um, and also the surface of the wing, as you can see here, was also warped from the sun. This was the plane after it was repaired from the first crash of the day with tape and glue. For the second flight of the day, it was able to take off and it flew for approximately 42 seconds before um, it ultimately crashed. However, we found while flying it that it was exceedingly difficult to control and it was difficult to maintain trim. And at one point we also lost, um, I guess, control of one of our ailerons. We weren't able to turn the plane as when we were controlling it to do so. Um, these results of the flight were, it was difficult to determine what exactly was the main cause of it. So we have a few different um, plans on how to fix them. We are going to use larger servos and switch from the nine gram to the 17 gram. We're hoping that that will help with the control of the plane and maybe the servos got overloaded and that this could mitigate that. And we are also planning on adding an incidence angle to the horizontal tail. We're still determining whether we use negative one to maybe negative negative three degrees. And we're gonna try to make the surface of the wing smoother and we can possibly paint the surface of the wing as well in order to maybe decrease the warping from the sun that's still to be determined. We're going to make the landing gear even wider even though it was taxiing significantly better this time. We think wider it couldn't help to do that. 
And then we also, even though we don't think flutter was an issue in this flight, we don't think it would hurt to use tape to cover the hinge gaps for our control surfaces to decrease flutter. These changes we expect to make within the week so that we can reprint and refly. And that is our progress so far. Questions? Um, great job. Um, thank you for the presentation. He's um, so much uh, progress compared to the term. <laughs> so much better. Um, so let's ask Tom's photographers. I don't know how to do that. How do I go to Zoom now? Do I have to go to Zoom? Uh, okay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> no, no, he is, I think. Yeah, sorry, I, I something went weird with the uh, the audio. I dropped it off and called back in, so I, I missed the last couple of uh, seconds of the presentation. Uh, it sounds like uh, plans to uh, correct uh, a, a couple of, of design flaws and, and fly again. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. When what's the timeline for that? When do you plan on uh, on flying again? Um. Our last day to fly is when? Next week? Next, I said fly to oh. next Friday. But oh, like, it was next Friday. But we're hoping to have all of our design adjustments done by the end of the week and start printing. Yeah, we heard some stuff coming. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so, so some things I, I was noticing in the presentation, I, I know we talked now, what, this was probably uh, a a little less than a month ago, and I saw some some distinct improvements. So so good job. I appreciate you uh, kind of taking some of that to heart. Um, when we were talking about the uh, the wing analysis, the stresses in the spars struck me as a little bit high. Could you could you go back to I think it was around slide ten or so. I apologize, I didn't write it down. That's okay. Eleven. I saw a lot of people writing down notes. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. There. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so we've got the load on the wing, um, and this is what? What was the load factor we were using here? Um, I think it was around two point. Um, I don't have the number off my head, but I, I think it was around two point five. Okay, so, but I mean, so you're assuming like a, a two point five g pull up maneuver in the plane. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So on the next slide, then. Okay. So these, the cross section of the tube run down your spar. That's that's the three quarter by point six centimeter. Um, and man, I mean, maybe maybe I just don't have a, a good feel for for the geometry, but. Uh, 366 MPA is something like 53 KSI, and I, I think in English units most of the time. So, 53 KSI seems like like a awfully high stress there, um, and and I can I can definitely appreciate you know from the standpoint of like optimizing a design that uh, you know that, that you're getting to a, a high stress and you know picking a, a material, um, but man, that just I'd, I'd have to sit and, and maybe calculate that out and, and see what I'd expect, but that that feels like a high stress. Um, I mean, but, I, well, I was essentially, you're, you're, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no problem. Um, for so, so one thing I'm I'm noticing there, and and maybe maybe it's just a typo on the slide, right? Your moment of inertia should be a length to the fourth power, um, and you, your units that that you list for the answer are correct, but. Uh, when you're talking about the formula, the the d squared minus d squared, oh. yeah, I, I don't know if that's just a typo or not. Um, that is a typo. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So then on the the slide following. So. And I, 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 the other thing I'll say is I appreciate, you know, you, you've got some hand calcs here, even though you have a picture of a fem. Um, so I can. <laughs> I just did that. I'm, I just I'm did not, that not going to pick. Yeah, I'm not going to pick too hard on the fan, but on the next slide here, um, so we've got the carbon fiber. Um, I I would maybe shy away from calling this a yield stress for a carbon fiber because carbon fiber materials tend to fail in a brittle manner; they don't yield. Um, but it, you know, if we want to call that just your allowable stress for your carbon, that's that's reasonable. Uh, margin of safety calculation looks good, and I know you know uh, some other. Teams and other classes have struggled with that, so so good job on that one, guys. Um, 
I like that you know you're, you're considering different materials here um, and and looking at both density and uh, and yield stress. I I assume that somewhere in there was a consideration of how do we you know can we size the material right? I mean cause, you know you're not necessarily locked into the geometry of a tube, so I assume there was some some consideration of that in there. Um, and then on uh, on the landing gear on slide 24, I actually did start writing slide numbers down. Yeah, so the main gear, actually, if we go back a slide, maybe. All right, so so you noted in the, the second design, and I'll say I like the second design, right? So the, the first design, um, you've got an attachment to the fuselage at two points, right? And and two points are always going to form a line, and so you're always going to want to, like, rock about those two points, which is going to in, introduce uh, a lot of stress because you don't have a, anything taking up uh, like there's there's no moment arm to react uh, like the loads that want to twist the landing gear off. Uh, so since you lengthen that connection uh, with glue and and duct tape, it sounds like um, now you've got a stronger joint. So I, I like that design. Um, you you noted that you had 10% uh, infill in this, and I'm I'm wondering. I mean, these look fairly thin. It was was the infill? What what did you save with the infill here? Like where where is the infill? Or I should say, where is the empty space? Uh, all the the it's hollow on the inside, and okay. so how thick how thick are those uh, beams? Uh, it's uh, two inches by one eighth inch. Okay, so even with the one eighth inch, you got a, a significant improvement by by doing the infill. How thick are, are the walls of the uh, of the beams? Know. It's when it's three D printed. It's two layers i think so that'd be 0. 0.8 millimeters okay all right so again i'm not a, a metric guy but 0. 0.8 millimeters you're talking about an eighth of an inch um and you've got 0. 0.8 millimeters on each side so you've got about 1.6 millimeters is i mean it's not a ton less than an eighth of an inch right so you don't you don't have a ton of of empty space in there um I wonder uh, when you're doing your stress analysis, right? You said uh, on the next slide. I, I like how you, you know, you kind of did um, a very simplified fem, right? That that f equals ku, right? That's that's fem stuff, and and I appreciate that, uh, you know, <laughs> I appreciate that you said that was a a very large matrix. Um, you know, certainly in the context of doing it by hand, it is. Um, in the context of doing a fem, it's not, but. Uh, uh, but that said, um, so you said you've got F equals KU, right? So you're, fig you're figuring the force in each beam. Um, and then what are you doing to calculate a stress in the beam from that? So I wrote a MATLAB program that uh, basically you uh, construct the K matrix and then you did a left division in MATLAB to give you your nodal displacements and rotations. Yep. I then use that to calculate strains. Mm -hmm. And then I then use that to calculate the stress in each beam. Okay. So when you're when you're figuring the strain in the beam, um you're assuming everything is acting actually? Uh not everything because there is those rotations at the node. And mm -hmm. I I think the assumption I made, and it, this could be a bad assumption, was that the rotations was equal to the uh, uh, the shear strain. Okay. And, yeah, I'd want to I'd want to think about that a little bit more. I'll I'll, I'll think about that some and, and write a comment. Um, let's see the uh, on slide twenty seven when we're talking about the stack stability versus uh, well when we're talking about stack stability. Stability. Um, I don't have a good feel for how that correlates to the maneuverability of the airplane. I know, um, you know, you, you're talking about you want something that's that's reasonably maneuverable to kind of meet uh, what you're calling your your surveillance goals. Is that does that line up with where you are? Um, yeah. Well, so for our pitch for our pitch moment um, and yaw moment, those were um, uh, like on the higher end, so they were stable. Our Roll moment 
um, I mentioned it was a little bit light on um, on that side, um, but that also could help with um, banking. Okay, how, in in the actual flight performance of, of the plane, as as much as as you were able to get, do you feel like? Um, I, I mean, geez, I, I don't know if anybody's got enough experience with with planes and and knowing the uh, the various stability coefficients. Um, but it, you know, did that seem to line up with uh, with the calculations, the actual performance of the airplane? Um, I would say probably not on our, our test flight, but that could be um, because if if our uh, we could, didn't have control of our control surfaces or um, the plane or the wing was already damaged, so um, there could be a lot of factors on that. But I would say no, probably. Okay. Um, and then the last thing on slide twenty nine, we're showing pictures of the construction. What am I? I'm I'm seeing this like uh, cross hatch pattern. What am I looking at here? The the cross uh, pattern is due to the three D printed like uh, settings that we have, and so uh, because the way the CAD model is. Uh, on the CAD model, these are like kind of like spa spaces, and they're small enough so the printer goes around them and then back again, and so it can it kind of creates like these like small, very small grooves on the on the surface. You can go to that. Is it going to be a challenge in the process, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. We are. Do you, do you expect that to have a an aerodynamic impact? Yeah, it doesn't. It definitely has. So, um, Tom. So here's the thing. Probably they didn't do much research on the product print, uh, printing slices. Um, so if they didn't change setting, it's probably like they have this kind of thing. Uh, but there is some option in the process that they can actually print the internal structure first, and then the outer layer, um, the wall is like one piece. So there would be no nothing on the surface. The out outer surface like print at one time. Yeah. You just need to do some research on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we yeah. could definitely do that. Uh, what I was thinking, yeah, the part, the way I researched about the X structure is like having the 3D printer like uh, continuously print like all these structures. So it's like, it doesn't have any faulty, like uh, what you say, faulty layers or anything. And so it's just like a continuous like printing process. Um, okay. But definitely, I mean, that can be definitely changed and just have the, like Dr. Tang said, uh, just, you know, print the structure first and then the layer. So we yeah, have that I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering how this would compare to, uh, you know, sort of a, a more traditional RC airplane where you, uh, you know, have a, a underlying structure and then, uh, you know, wrap it with the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, the way we really um, approach this manufacturing process is just, like just a hundred percent just using the three D printers and just not partially well partially just focusing on that and mainly just you know have the whole that done in one go instead of just you know meticulously like going through all that. Which I mean it speed us our manufacturing process. So yeah, that's yeah. the main focus. Okay. That's all I got for now. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I want to say overall great job is so much better than us. <laughs> um, and also for the, like for the presentation itself, um, I, I want to first, I want to say the presentation is something that we need to train for this past because it's, it's in requiring a bad, it's not, I am a crazy person that I'm forcing that to like practice presenting. It's required for our senior design class. Uh, so for the presentation part, I really like the size. Uh, it's very clean, very comfortable to read, no crazy size, anything. Um, I feel very comfortable with read all slides. And the presentation itself um, is so much better than also, I really like it. So this is uh, the presentation part. Um, and let's talk about some details. Uh, the first one is page eight. <laughs> I'm not good at computer, but I feel this should be a fast <laughs> Just, just stretch faster. Okay. Uh, so it doesn't mean that I I think I talked about last time. I think I put in the announcement sickening digit. When reference area was point to put that 303.394. Uh what's the difference with 300? 
Oh, uh -huh. you talking about six pigs? What? Like significant six, figures? Significant digits. This is is not necessary to show us point three nine four. You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> I I put in the announcement. Uh, uh, not sure you guys read it or not. So it's it's really not necessary. Okay. Um, and page nine. Uh, so it's a uh, internal structure. I still am I, I, I'm not convinced. What, why do you guys need this much like internal the life structure? Um, my personal opinion is that well, I I feel like we probably don't need this much. And also in your calculation, you didn't really consider like what is life structure really increase the strength of the wing. In your calculation, it's all about the uh, carbon fiber tube. Uh, it, there's no calculation really like, oh, my internal uh, supporting structure helped uh, the strength or anything. That's, it was not really involved in your calculation, but you need really convince me why this is necessary. Mm -hmm. It shows the calculation, we really need this internal supporting structure to increase the strength of the wing. And then I can. I, I can say, okay, it's okay to do that. But for me right now, I feel like, why? <laughs> why? It, especially um, with your previous skill, you, you make so many bridges on, on surface. So, um, and this, you need to do some analysis to show me why it's necessary. Um, and page 11. Um, I'm a little confused because I think I heard something like a little distribution and then I heard some linear distribution for your capitalization. You ask the same question. Yeah. yeah. So I think we have the ability to, to cap, do this calculation using a little distribution. There's no really, we we don't really need to simplify as linear distribution because it will, create, it will generate large error. Uh, and Using consider is a little distribution. The calculation is not that complicated, and I show all the equations. <laughs> That's what I mean. I mean, you already have all the equations I showed in class. You just use the equations, and you're done. Why? Why do you want to use linear distribution? Is well, it was. I think well. So the reason I went with that was because it's more of a, it's less than elliptical wing and more of like it's just tapered, right? So it it's it's linear. Yeah, it's tapered, but the lift distribution is not tapered. It's elliptical. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well. <laughs> what, what do you mean? I I, I don't think <laughs> I don't think I think um, like the using the taper ratio shows a more accurate lift distribution lift distribution than an elliptical wing. Let's, because... let's be logically. We are talking about stress analysis here. Yes. We are talking about the force calculation and everything. I'm talking about the force distribution is you know is elliptical. You are talking about the taper ratio, which is the wing shape is linear. Yeah. That's not confusing. Your wing shape okay. can be you know can has taper ratio. That's that's okay. But I'm talking about lift distribution is elliptical. I I found I just I found a source that that kind of kind of what that 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 showed that you could you could account for elliptical distribution yes. by moving it up. Yes. Distribution just... is elliptical. Distribution is not linear. That's what I mean. Yeah. Your calculation, what, in your presentation, I remember you said you uh, you simplify as linear distribution to calculate the force. Well, it, it's not just linear. It was linear, and they moved it up according to the elliptical distribution. So it, it wouldn't it wouldn't just be linear like this, like not like normal linear. Okay. Right. It would be linear moved up according to how the elliptical distribution affects it. <laughs> it's more it's i mean engineers we do some approximation we use simplified model but if we already have the alien distribution uh calculation available or it's very easy to calculate why do you want to use linear distribution to calculate because i feel like we try to get as closer at what real situation is the real situation is a level distribution and now you have the equation of calculating using elliptical distribution. Why do you want to use linear distribution? That's fair. Yeah. Right. And also the when, the moment equation. I feel like when you no matter you use linear distribution or elliptical distribution, I don't care. Um, if you already assume a distribution, why the table ratio is still in consideration in your wing calculation? Uh, the moment element because 
once you consider the distribution of force, the table ratio is already considered in that distribution. Mm -hmm. And in your moment calculation, there should be no number. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like double count to the table ratio in your calculation. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because you need table ratio for the liquid distribution and why, and then you have a distribution, and then in your moment of calculation, you have a number again. I mean, yeah. why? You only use once. That's fair. Yeah. Right. So this is the calculation here and page uh, 12. So uh, great calculation. Uh, and I feel, uh, I, I feel the same thing as Tom. I think the stress calculation is a bit higher. Uh, and also, based on my comparison, I'm not saying which group is correct or which group is wrong. But I compare the calculation for different groups, uh, different other groups. So I'm not saying that other groups are correct or you're wrong, but you probably stop checking. And another thing that you have the tube, um, common fiber tube for the structure, internal structure to carry the stress or something. Uh, I think in one graph, I, I don't remember which graph, or I, I also seen your aircraft, it's like the tube is really not at the bottom or at the top surface. It's someone in the middle. Yeah. Your signal max stress is, you when you use MC over I, the stress is either top and bottom magnitude, compressed with tens tensile stress. You know what I mean? Yeah. The stress is calculated at the upper or lower surface. Your carbon fiber tube is somewhere in between. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you know the problem? Uh, yeah, I understand. <laughs> yeah. So if you really want to use like, okay, let's say, oh, your strength is already wrong. Oh, Tom already mentioned that. So let's say I have the carbon fiber tube. I have calculated maximum stress. If you really want to calculate safety fiber, safety margin, or anything, your carbon fiber tube should be either at the bottom or top surface where your maximum stress exists. Now your maximum stress is at top bottom and your carbon fiber tube is at middle where the stress is not really that high. <laughs> yeah. So what's the point? Mm -hmm. You know what it sounds Yeah, I just, I don't understand how we would design a wing to where like it would actually stick to the wing, right? Does that you make can, sense? You can, you can make the, the tube like getting closer to the either surface. Okay. Yeah, that's sense. cool because yeah. you in the bending, in the mechanical materials probably already, you should remember that in the mechanical materials, uh, when you put a tube at neutral surface, neutral surface, the stress is zero. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to put a structural component where the stress is zero? Yeah, that's it doesn't make sense. Right, you can increase the you can increase the diameter so the outer diameter is is very close to the, the scale. Yeah, you think like getting closer to the upper uh, well, so that's 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 I understand. But if you put put a cover cover tube which is like really counter level, do you put it at, around neutral surface? I mean, what's the point? Why? I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is uh, page 12. Uh, uh, and, and I think somewhere in between uh, uh, some, I, I don't remember this uh, page number. I think someone said uh, uh, the cover, you also have the internal support structure. I mean, why? Hmm? The, the nose cover? Oh, the nose cover? Yeah. No. I think you design something like uh, you have there. the internal support structure, but is it really like very high stress on the nose cover? Well, it was just to like make sure that like you know like it doesn't because if there was nothing, it would be just like a like a 0.4 millimeter layer, right? And so it would be like you know bending inwards. I mean, right? Where does the bending come from on the nose cover? Well, I mean, first from grabbing it, right, and then second. Okay, like the wind of the right because this is in front and if like if it crashes too like that yeah that too yeah we've and so our nose has not been okay very, yeah. um my personal opinion is there's not much force applied on the cover cover is just cover <laughs> because if you consider like force applied in, in the where, where the force applied what which which location force applied which with other condition i mean cover is just you know <laughs> Okay. If you talk about a wing, yes, there's a force applied. We have if you're landing gear, when you land, it's an impact force. But cover, I don't know. Um, uh, page 22. Yeah, so, um, 
I don't know much about this, but I'm, I was wondering if this is the reason why it's hard to control. What? The spring system like that, the rabbit and the wheel. No. No? No. That's actually very, that's a good design. Okay. In terms of the steerable on the, on the ground. Okay. You just need stronger servos. Okay. Okay. No, they, yeah, they're almost on the ground. We're talking about like the problem. The, ground, the, the problem might be like this this space right here. When I don't know if it's space. You come out on the ground in the air. I don't know if that's the thing. Oh. Well, you got to figure out. <laughs> you still have two weeks. Not 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 two weeks. Well, while we're here on the slide, I might as well ask a question since we're here. Um, do you think we could have gone with a smaller tail wheel? Smaller? Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't really looked into that. Like, I think I showed because out of these options for tail assembly, I think it was actually the smallest they had for like the whole assembly because the wheel is already attached to the whole thing. Okay. I'm pretty sure when I looked, I could double check, but like there might have been one size smaller, but there wasn't much smaller for this assembly itself. Okay. So you were just uh, limited on something like yeah, options. Yeah. Uh, 24, page 24. Which one's this? 13. So. Okay. so <laughs> Um, sorry, I'm a crazy about those. Uh, uh, professional this, but um, I remember someone did a pro uh, talk about this last. If you talk about use, it comes to different class system, yeah. We're talking about last time or this time, this time, this time, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. today, yeah, today. Is that this is like a trust system? Mm -hmm. Why trust system has three degree people for each node? Sorry, why trust system has. Three degree freedom for each node. Oh, it's it's a frame. Trust. Frame. Sorry. Yeah, uh, that's what I mean. Um, I misspoke. Sorry. Yeah. The, the math was done as a frame by trust. Yeah, because now you have eleven nodes. You have like uh thirty three. So I assume you have three degree freedom each each node. And if it's three degree freedom at each node, it's it's definitely not trust. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, speaking pages, of course. Um. And I was wondering, so you, you mentioned that four seats of high node one, no, the eight, uh, 11? 11, yeah. Uh, where is body condition? Oh, what the boundary that? conditions are U5, U6, U7, V, uh, V5, V6, V7, and theta six, all equals zero. V5, Six and seven. Seven. Okay. Basically, where the uh, landing gear attaches to the fuselage, since we're gluing. So um, let's see. Is there some picture notes before this? Uh, since we're gluing here, okay, it's fixed. Okay. And uh, I assume that that would still rotate. Okay. So that's why I kept it. the node. Uh, five and seven would still rotate. Okay. So that's why I kept them free. Okay. Okay. Uh, how about four and eight? It's free to move, free to rotate. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um. So in your calculation project, I don't think it's three by three because uh, thirty three by thirty three because after you you remove the boundary condition. Okay. Well, the after you apply boundary conditions, it yeah. becomes a twenty six by twenty six. Yeah. Um, so weird. Yeah. The calculation part because not only we show the dimension of the three dimensions, we we it's actually no calculation of what is dimension. It's not like the total. Yeah. Um. And I think when you explain to Tom, is that something is equal to shear strain? What what? So the rotations. I uh. So you have uh, U, V, and theta. Yeah. Why rotation equals shear strength? Hmm? Why rotation is equal to shear strength? I, I was kind of rushing. What? I'll, be, I'll be honest. Uh, when I was, uh, the problem I came up with was I couldn't find how to get from the rotations to shear strain to shear stress. And I spent two hours just scrolling through my FEA textbook, my FEA notes. I spent a long time trying to find anything. And then I said, okay, this is in radians. Radian, uh, shear strain is also in radians. They're the same. Because I just, I gave up. After in some situation, yes. 
Okay. In some situation, yes, but I'm not saying you're correct. I didn't. <laughs> It, like I said, it could have been a bad assumption. And in some situation, yes, but that in your situation, do more research. If you want to talk to me, I'm happy to help. Uh, I don't know everything about FDA, but I may provide some help. Uh, so you'll find a report I need. Mm -hmm. um, and page 26. Maybe 27. 27? Stability. Oh, no. So it's fine. I think it. Yeah. Uh, 28. So I think in the presentation you mentioned the x axis is time. What is y axis? Oh, here? Yeah. Damn, I'm really sorry. I don't know why the quality went down so bad, but this is the angle B, which is follow, uh, is showing the angle of disturbance for the uh, jaw moment. Yeah, that's what I said in, in the presentation when we make slides. Um, if something I cannot see, it's the right information. Yeah, no, I had, the, I, I had the wrong quality. I don't know what happened when I pasted yeah. in the in the presentation. I, I mean, apologize. It's so close, and we're going to see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, 29. Uh, great job that you make the screws are smaller. Uh, the second one, you change the interior of the wing structure. What which part do you change? So if you see here, the wing structure is a lot closer together versus the wings down here. So we increase the space between the ribs inside the wing, which okay. reduce the weight. Great job. Yeah, from 30, 30 millimeters to 60 millimeters. Maybe you can remove this time. Yeah. <laughs> uh well well if, if you really want to use it you need to prove to me why it's necessary mm -hmm. to me some calculation right otherwise if you like in your calculation there's really no internal support is the, the that structure exists so what, i mean why do you want to put it there? um so uh these are all my comments but overall great job thank you okay thank you um, I got a couple, a couple of um, small notes. Um, back to the elliptical lift, lift distribution thing. This is more of can we go back a, slide or just it's fine. Um, this is more of just like something that you could do. Um, I don't know if you guys used an XFLR five model, but one thing that you can do with that is you can pull data off of XFLR five, or it will give you a lift distribution. So. If you want to numerically integrate that, that is always an option, and that will account for your actual wing aerodynamics instead of just assumption. Um, and I think you can do the same thing for the moment as well. So just something that you could do um, that might honestly simplify some things, but also give you a little bit more accuracy because it is using the design of your plane itself. Um, or some of the other ones. I have something on um, slide 12. Oh, yeah, okay. So, um, keep going. Yeah, keep going. I just had a thought about the, we talked about this stress number a little bit. So, this, this is assuming that all of the load is just on the spar itself. Yeah. Right? Okay. So, I maybe that. That is why that number is a little high, is because obviously you do have an entire wing structure and you're yeah. just not really accounting for it. So um, probably something just to add in. Like, I think that the analysis itself being done on the spar is probably a good idea, but also make sure you consider that, yeah, you do have an entire wing there too. So I was pretty much just factoring into like safety. Yeah. Because yeah. like, yeah, um, be just like, though. I don't know, maybe something to to add in there just so there's a little bit less confusion. Like a note, like, like say that this is just assuming that the BS yeah. is carrying all the um, And then, okay, uh, slide 28, just want to talk about the stability a little bit. Um, there's not a faster way. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is just one note about this graph, and I know it's not like immediately obvious, but I think if this 
was like the whole graph wasn't used. I think anywhere it's hard to see what time it is, but I, maybe after like oh, he's in six seconds. seconds. Yes, but I'm saying like maybe after like ten seconds, most of that isn't really useful. So changing that would oh go like submitting to yeah uh, to the actual so how it will like fluctuate with like a closer yeah uh, because so realistically the whole forty seconds doesn't matter. That is fair. Don't be making it put before that. Um, so. Yeah, it just makes it a little bit hard to see what's going on. Um, and then, yeah, like what is the like the highest amplitude of that? I can't really tell. Is that like six? It's like, like about seven. seven. It's about seven degrees. And then this is for okay. Um, yeah, it goes like like this. Uh, it's a little bit of a aggressive movement but it goes back like really quickly yeah that happens. might be a, uh, it's hard to say so one of the things that is just tricky about all the stability for this class in general is that we do have data but all of it's for real planes so it's hard to say what is directly kind of like what can be translated to rc planes because mm -hmm. i think in some cases you can assume that something like poles are going to transfer over but without any data it's kind of hard to say so we are working with what we got um but on that note i think it's one slide up uh, the static stability stuff so yeah these poles are all and the the derivatives are all stable um but I think for something like your plane, there might be some gremlins in this and that like, I think these are going to lead to it being a little twitchy. Like I think um, on the like whole range, they're a little bit close to marginal safe, like marginally stable in the sense that like, like I think um, just from what I've seen, the, um, like the CM alpha could probably be a little bit more negative. Um, the CN beta could probably be a, a little bit more positive. Like the CN beta is honestly something that I'd maybe worry about because it's very close to being marginally stable. And this might be where some of the like characteristics are coming from. And I know that like, like, yeah, you guys designed a stable plane, but in the details that like, I know that Lynn doesn't really teach like what is a good pole or what is a good derivative. It's just like stable is good. So um, like later this week, if you guys want to, um, if someone wants to work with me on kind of like trying to figure out some of this stuff and like see if there's any small improvements that could be made for your time, final test play, I would be willing to do that. That sounds good though. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that's everything that I have. So your static margin number there, that is static margin, right? The SM? Yes. So is that is that 0. 0.49 or 0. 0.489% or is that like 48%? 48%. Yeah. Stable. Do we see that as any kind of issue or well, is that is that a good number? It's why well, I looked online and said above zero is stable. Correct. And so I thought that was, I mean, that basically that means the center of gravity is like 50% of the cord of the wing in front of the aerodynamic center. Okay, because I can say that that would definitely explain quite a few characteristics of the airplane, um, being that it was hard to control. Partially of the reason why it was hard to control, because that means a CG is significantly forward of the uh, of the aerodynamic center. And I know like a Cessna is like 19% stable. And that's like a very, very stable, nice handling airplane. Um, I believe I can add something in this. I'm just actually realizing this now. Yeah, a static margin that is around 0.5 and then a CM alpha that is only negative 0.7. I'd like to look at that more because like with a higher static margin, you should probably be getting a higher CM alpha. So it's curious, but. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So like we would definitely want to relook into that number and adjust accordingly. Uh, if we go to slide 26 real quick. I first want to say about slide 26. I like this. I think this is good. The only thing that I don't like about it is that you're showing your CG to be very far aft. Is there a reason for this? 
Well, like here you're showing your CG to be like unstable essentially. Oh, that we, I didn't we even know that. We pulled it from uh, the SolidWorks, SolidWorks directly. Okay. So it had like a. That's before like the system was put yeah. in there. And so it. That might be a good thing to note because yeah. if you're going to show people totally like this that. and then go and do yeah. the totally stability better. stuff. Better yeah. That. Otherwise, I like the diagram. I think that's pretty neat. Cool. Other than the CG thing. Um, Slide 25, you can go back. <laughs> um, I'm not trying to make you jump around too much. You you report your static thrust to be 3.8 pounds with what propeller? Uh, the 10 by 7 propeller. So it's the same propeller you guys use? Yeah. Okay, so what does that bring your thrust to weight again? Thrust to weight is 60%. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool, sorry. Um, and then one more thing. You guys had like three spars for your horizontal tail. Yeah. What's the purpose of that? Why three? I mean, why not just two or even... Done. <laughs> well, that was just well. Material. I guess two do really help with just alignment because it was just alignment and plus just because uh, sometimes they would like because they're kind of small, I guess, and so they would probably fall out or something. Okay, but so, I suspect that um, you probably could just get rid of that entirely. Like you probably only need one, if that, and you're gonna glue glue it on anyway. Yeah, because it's it, they both have flat surfaces, so that'd be talk as engineer. Uh -huh. <laughs> like show your feeling or something. If you really want to say something is necessary, show I'll show your analysis to mm -hmm. prove that it's necessary. Otherwise, move okay. it. Okay. Yeah. And then one last quick note um, for some of the views that you guys show about your airplane in the beginning, like four through seven or something like that. You can really combine a lot of those into one concise slide, and also um, the gloss makes it a little hard to see. So if we could try to figure out a way to make the model a little bit easier to see, the gloss was just like, some of the edges look a little, like it's just hard to get the full picture because the gloss is like reflected. But otherwise, I think it was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you very much. Yeah, those were all great job and yeah. let's get flying. Yeah. How do I? Yeah. 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 Yeah.